Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Minui Maitri. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. Today, at least in America, uh, yesterday in Vietnam, uh, is the Vulan Festival, also known as Vula, Vulan Bao Hing, which is translated into English roughly as to the Ghost Festival and Filial Piety. Uh, and you see it everywhere um, at all the temples. The two words are always together, Bulan Bauhin. Um, Bulan meaning the Ulambana festival, the ghost festival, and Bauhin meaning filial piety. And they don't separate the two because the ghost festival, uh, historically in East Asian Buddhism, um, is a celebration of parents and of a child's devotion to his or her parents. And while this seems very um, Confucianist, it seems very traditional Chinese uh, filial piety type of uh, focus, there's actually a lot of focus in uh, historical Buddhism, both in the Pali Canon and the historical Chinese agamas, which uh, parallel each other quite quite a bit um, that shows that the historical Buddha Shakyamuni Buddha um, focused frequently his discussions on a duty that a child owes to his or her parents and uh, just there there are many examples of that but just as one example uh, in the Samyutta Nikaya the Buddha is talking about um, how Saka, the lord of the, or the king of the devas, um, how he lived his life prior to um, becoming Sakya, Saka. And, um, and so in the Samyutta Nikaya, it says this, it says, at Sawati, because in the past, when Saka, lord of the devas, was a human being, he adopted and undertook seven vows by the undertaking of which he achieved the status of Sakya. What were the seven vows? They are this. One, as long as I live, may I support my parents. Two, as long as I live, may I respect the family elders. Three, as long as I live, may I speak gently. Four, as long as I live, may I not speak divisively. Five, as long as I live, may I dwell at home with a mind devoid of the stain of stinginess, freely generous, open-handed, delighting in relinquishment, devoted to charity, delighted in giving and sharing. Six, as long as I live, may I speak the truth. Seven, as long as I live, may I be free from anger. And if anger should arise in me, may I dispel it quickly. In the past, bhikkhus, when Saka, Lord of the Devas, was a human being, he adopted and undertook these seven vows, by the undertaking of which he achieved the status of Sakya. And then the Buddha gives the following uh, gata, which doesn't really rhyme too much in English, but uh, I guess in the original Pali it did. When a person supports his parents and respects the family elders, when his speech is gentle and courteous, and he refrains from divisive words, when he strives to remove meanness, is truthful and vanquishes anger, the Tabatim Sadevas call him a truly superior person. So I use this just as one example, and the Buddha has many examples, both, as I said, in the Pali Canon and in the Chinese Agamas, um, that discuss at great length a child's duty of piety to his or her parents and the duty that we owe. And one, and one uh, sutta in the uh, Anguttara Nikaya, um, 
the Buddha uh, a little bit tongue in cheek when he's talking about um, Brahma, who is in kind of in Hindu um, in Hindu religion, believed to be like the god of the universe, the creator of all mankind. Um, the Buddha says, who you should be paying reverence to are those who really gave you life, not Brahma, but your parents. Um, and those are the ones that you should be de devoting your energies to. So, um, as I said, while we often look at the Ulambana um, festival, uh, the Yulanpen festival, as it's called in Chinese, or in the old Taoist uh, words, they call it the ghost festival, the Zhongyuan festival. Um, while these all have a lot of Chinese roots to them, they also have roots in ancient India as well. Uh, and so I think it's important to realize that while each of these traditions of, uh, of the many cultures in Korea and Japan, um, in my case here in Vietnam uh, and in China, while they all have their own traditions by dating back through early Confucianism, et cetera, uh, filial piety, it is also long lasting within the realm of Buddhism. Um, but as Buddhism developed and, and spread throughout China, um, it became clear that um, tying some of these uh, traditions, uh, cultural traditions of ancient China and the filial piety ideas of those into a, a, a better Buddhist Dharma discussion um, became necessary. And it was along these lines that the Ulambana Sutta or the, I should say the Ulambana Sutra um, came into being. Was um, it was originally thought to have been um, translated uh, in the early second century, late third century. Um, I'm sorry, in the late second century, early third century uh, of the Common Era, um, from Sanskrit into Chinese, but. More recent scholarship has shown that some of the words referring to the Ulambana Sutra were not used in Sanskrit, uh, at least until around the fifth or sixth century. Uh, and so it was probably a later creation. Nevertheless, the, the story um, is an important part of the traditions that go on now. And part of the traditions that we celebrate here in Vietnam uh, when we celebrate um, the Vulan Baohin Festival. So let's talk about that just a little bit, and then I'll share with you guys uh, in the chat. I'll upload for you or share with you a, a link so that you can have this if you want it. But uh, the Ulambana Sutra, uh, I won't read the whole thing, but the Ulambana Sutra goes like this. Uh, there was a great monk um, who followed the Buddha, and most of you know him as uh, Mahamogalana, who was known as the second great disciple of the Buddha. So Mahamogalana and Shariputra uh, we're best friends growing up, just so you're aware. Um, so Mahamogalana and Shariputra were best friends growing up. Um, they had um, done everything together. Both come from very wealthy uh, Brahmin families. And uh, eventually, though, uh, when they were about 30 years old, they decided to uh, leave the home life and become monks. And... Uh, the Buddha, they were older than the Buddha by about four or five years. And so uh, the Buddha had not yet begun his ministry and had not yet had his own enlightenment. But they set out and they studied under many different teachers, uh, similar to the Buddha did, looking for their own um, path, uh, their own path to awakening. Uh, long story short, uh, they did this for about 10 years or so together, maybe a little bit longer, and they never found out what they were looking for. And they more or less gave up and they went back home. They went back home to their uh, home villages and said, you know what, traveling together and studying together, we just didn't come to what we were looking for. Um, let's split up and um, whoever finds the Dharma first will come and get the other one. And, uh, and that's kind of what happened. And uh, so uh, Mahamogalana was the first to actually hear the, the teachings of the Buddha. And he came back to Shariputra and said, hey, you got to hear this. This is some great stuff. This is it. And they both went and they both uh, uh, ordained under the Buddha. And, uh, and they took with them some of the previous students that they had traveled with. Um, and 
lots of lots of bhikkhus then um heard the dharma from the buddha and and became fully enlightened at beings at that time nevertheless long story short um as you probably know, Shariputra became kind of the right-hand man of the Buddha, the, the chief disciple, and Mahamogalana became the second chief disciple of the Buddha. Um, and they were known for two things. Shariputra was known for his, his great intelligent wisdom, uh, and Mahamogalana was known for his ability um, to, to master the psychic powers of, of the great ones. And in these psychic powers, uh, Mahamogalana gained the ability to see uh, the past, the future. Um, he could see the lives of other people and what had happened to them. And so he went looking through his psychic powers. He went looking for his mother. What had happened to his mother after she had passed away? Well, the Ulambana Sutra tells us that Mahamogalana, after he had attained these six supernatural powers, he discovered that his mother had been reborn in the hungry ghost realm. Uh, she had been reborn in hell as a hungry ghost. And uh, he went there and he tried to, um, to save his mother and he wanted to give her rice and he gave her, he gave her some rice to eat, but it immediately burst into flames and turned into ash in her mouth and he was unable to feed her. So the Ulambana Sutra goes that he came to the Buddha and he told the Buddha, he says, hey, I, world honored one, I found my mother. And she's burning in hell as a hungry ghost. Uh, I tried to feed her. I can't do it. And the Buddha basically said this. He said, there is some karma that you just can't save someone from. And the only thing you can do is give offerings to the Sangha. And when you give offerings to the Sangha, uh, the Sangha as a whole uh, can transfer their merit to these people uh, and that can help deliver them from the gates of hell. And so Mahamogalana did that. He gave, he came at the, uh, and the Buddha told him, you have to do this at the 15th day of the seventh month, um, which in Mahayana tradition, that represents the full moon that ends the rains retreat season. Uh, so you see that here comes the tie to this monastic order and what the Hungry Ghost Festival is about. It's about the end of the rain season when the monks have been secluded away and they have been practicing diligently for three months during the rainy season. They have gained a lot of merit uh, because of the diligence of their practice and not going out and not, um, not teaching, not doing, uh, not traveling, but they just stay in one place and they um, seek to um, perfect themselves, find their own enlightenment, to find their own path. And so a lot of merit has been gained. And so the Buddha says, this is the time, Mahamogalana, for you at the end of the rain season, for you to present these offerings to the Sangha. And when you do, the Sangha can transfer its merit to these, to these people. So Mahamogalana uh, did exactly that. And uh, and then he looked and he saw that his mother had been delivered from the realms of hell. So part of what's not included in the sutra, but is included kind of in the commentaries that go along with sutras, is that there was kind of a step-by-step -step process of leaving hell. And that after one leaves the hungry ghost realm, that one uh, will enter into the animal realm. And some part of the history behind this is that Mahamogalana's mother was reborn as a dog. And Mahamogalana was not satisfied with this. Uh, and in that bodhisattva spirit and filial piety spirit, he's like, this is not good enough. I need my mother to be reborn as a, as a human being. Without being reborn as a human being, she'll never have the opportunity for, for her own enlightenment. Uh, so again, the next year he came and he offered again the same things uh, so that his mother could then be reborn out of the animal realm into the human realm. So again, that part is not in the Ulambana Sutra, uh, but it's part of the story that goes along with um, Mahamogalana's diligence and constantly seeking uh, the improvement of his mother after her life. Um, there's lots of interesting stories that talk about Mahamogalana and his previous lives um, and what had happened to him in his previous lives and, and karma that he had to get rid of himself. 
um, and, ha- and that being the reason why he was murdered um, about six months before the Buddhist party in Obama. So um, all of those things are very interesting and I'll be happy to upload to you. There's a, I have an excerpt from a, from a book that was written called uh, uh, The Lives of the Great Disciples of the Buddha. And um, so this was written back in the early 90s. And uh, it gives you, a, there's a whole history of Mahamogulana and his relationship with Shariputra, et cetera. So if you're interested in that, I'll be happy to share that too. Um, but what I wanted to kind of point out to you is that this story of the Ulambana Sutra, Ulambana, there's lots of discussion as to the origins of the word, but basically it translates as a tray. And so the Ulambana Sutra was the tray of offerings that's brought to um, the Sangha. Um, And so it's really, we call it the Hungry Ghost Festival because that's kind of the history behind the story. That's kind of the adaptation that comes from, um, you know, how how Buddhism mixed with Taoism and Confucianism as it came into China, et cetera. Um, But the reality is it's a festival about making offerings to the Sangha, the Mahasangha, the, the by that, they don't mean the lay, but they mean, to, they mean the ordained Sangha members, and to seek the merits for, um, for other people. And so in the Mahayana tradition, there's a lot of people who think that even though Mahamogalana had already attained his arhatship, that post-attainment of that arhatship, he gained that bodhisattva ideal, that his goal was then to help other people. And it was most manifest in helping his own parents. And so uh, now in Vietnamese tradition, when they do chanting, that part of the end of their chanting during the Wulan festival is to chant Namo Mahamogalana Bodhisattva. Uh, and while they do that in, in Vietnamese, um, that's the English translation of it. And uh, I think it's really interesting to, to see how they have taken a historical Theravadan figure, a historical um, uh, Arhat figure, and turn him into a Bodhisattva. And, but the stories behind Mahamogalana tend to affirm that, you know, and I think it's really interesting as you compare and contrast the Theravada tradition and the Mahayana traditions, a lot of the things that the Mahayana tradition seems to want to answer are things that the Buddha didn't talk about, like does the fully enlightened one live after death? What is he? Where does he exist? What is he? And all these things the Buddha said very point blank in the Pali Canon. He says, I don't talk about those things because none of them matter to your own awakening. Um, but Mahayana is when we talk about them. <laughs> and uh, one of the things we talk about is that uh, Mahamogalana became a bodhisattva and will continue to come back and serve and try to save other people. So as we seek that bodhisattva ideal in our own lives, uh, we need to recognize that that's what that's what the Vulant festival is about. Um, so, as I said, today is the day that we remember our parents uh, in Vietnam. If your parents are deceased, they will wear a white rose or a white flower on their lapel. Uh, and if their parents are still alive, they will wear a red flower on their lapel uh, as a way to indicate uh, that they're paying honor either to their deceased parents or their to or to their living parents. Um, I asked my wife just out of curiosity, I said, well, you have one parent who's passed away and one parent who's alive. Do you wear one of each flower? She said, no, we just wear one white flower. So um, <laughs> while that, that seems like a legitimate question to me, she thought it was a little bit silly, like, no, of course I wear a white one. <laughs> so um, anyway, that's a little bit of the history behind the Wulan Festival, the Zhongyuan Festival. Um, it's, it is, as some people have called it, the equivalence of Halloween in America. Um, but um, it is the day that we remember the dead um, and more the dead uh, that need our help, that need our merit so that we can help them seek uh, their own ultimate enlightenment. So thank you all. And uh, I hope that today on this Wednesday, you'll remember your parents uh, that gave you birth, that gave you this opportunity to, uh, to live in a human form and to find your own enlightenment. Thank you.